doing okay? We're doing great. Yeah. Are you doing They're okay? Right. Are you? Yeah. In, how nervous are you? Yeah, we're okay. Absolutely far more nervous than I thought I would be. That's not an exaggeration. Really? I, and I've done this before. I, I mean, know. Not we feel like we we try to make everybody <clears throat> super comfortable, though. Milady. Oh God, excuse um, me. Sorry. Bang in. Well, you guys are great, I, but I'm nervous. So that's you know. I'm a You're nervous, doing great. I'm a nervous type. We're starting to get a little yeah, sorry. crazy. We can edit here. this out, right? <laughs> oh, can we get oh yeah. This part? <laughs> we'll, we'll edit all this We're out. We're leaving all of it in. No, we'll, we'll edit all this it's out. It's gonna be part one, part two, part three, <laughs> part four, part five. Oh my! Ten. It's a cereal. Uh, it's a cereal. <laughs> it's a cereal. <laughs> this week. This week with that shit. <laughs> yeah. I man. love it. Yeah, I was just at um, Dermot Kennedy with Chris in Denver, and we paid to be up on the balcony uh -huh. when we got there. So, because Chris gets like show anxiety where he's in the crowd and he doesn't like it. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I relate to that. I, I love it too. I'm like total opposite. I want to be like in the crowd because like the crowd's like the body of the show, and then when you're in the body of the show, you can feel the body move with the show, and it's just no, this whole other thing. Shit. No, I know. I, I don't know. I just love it. I think you just blew my mind. It's real, you know. It is real though. She, it, you, you know, you just feel it a lot deeper when you're there, and I felt very detached from the show being up there. So I couldn't thank you for the. <laughs> well, the truth is, so like when, you know, like, especially like festivals and stuff, I, I do remember going to like Lollapalooza, like the first Lollapalooza. A friend of mine was playing, and um, her band was playing on the second stage or something, but um, I, I remember hearing about it for so long, this thing's coming, this like event. Mm -hmm. Nothing existed like that before, as far as I, I mean, you had Woodstock or whatever, right. but like this traveling circus thing. Yeah, that was one of the very first. And everybody that showed up was you. Like, mm -hmm. everybody was incredibly like-minded, for better or worse, you know. Yeah, and, festival uh, people are festival people. Well, it's... and that's changed. So, like, everybody that showed up, in my estimation, was there to see, like, their favorite band or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now, when I talk to people about festivals, it's like, well, we've picked out the glow sticks that we're going to wear around our neck, and we've yeah. picked out the whatever the fuck. They're not Three going for, like, serious. serious. That's, yeah, that's what it seems like. I absolutely am an old it's, man at this point. Yeah, it's but. totally true. I know tons of people. Like my friend that's at Stagecoach right now, it wasn't anything about the lineup. It was about going to the festival. It's an event yeah, now. Like speaking, like I don't think people understand how big a deal bands were in the like the '90s or whatever, mm -hmm. or the '80s. You know, mm -hmm. for instance, what what did we see? Uh, uh, there was a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction. And the cure was inducted, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting. And so they started playing, and what you saw, and this isn't an exaggeration, you can watch the footage. I pointed it out to my wife. I was like, holy shit, look at this. Uh, every woman in that crowd was up and dancing while all the dudes were just like sitting at their table. <laughs> but they, they were all people my age or older or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, and that was their favorite band at one point. Like, right. the cure was kind of a different thing. It was like a. A dividing line for a bunch of people you know? right but people had favorite band I mean like you right Jane's Addiction being one that I think of like what I saw at their shows and I saw them several times it was just like a religious experience for people yeah like a really should be. <laughs> dangerous scary religious experience you know? and you, or Jesus Lizard like those yeah. bands that are just like impossibly good and and you it's hard to equate it to other things I mean you know, I know people were into like the Almond Brothers or whatever, or like jam bands, but like as far as rock shows, I, d I don't see that kind of energy being replaced by anybody. Not at this point. No. You know? I was just talking to her daughter about this earlier. I used to, uh, I kind of got my start with like really, really loving live music by going to a bunch of metal concerts right on. in Arkansas, and it's like 13 to 17, I think. I, I didn't go to any different type of concert besides what that. What kind of bands are we talking about here? Oh, man. All kinds. There's people that really wouldn't classify as metal, like Three Days Grace and stuff like that. But then it was like Drowning Pool and Rob Zombie and oh, Corn sure, yeah. and God Smack and like all of these crazy. There's one that God had like craziness and Cedar doesn't really feel a little bit softer. But all of these people and it was a lot of fun. Um, 
but you don't get that kind of con at least I don't get that concert experience anymore. People go and it's like it is a religious experience yeah. to go to these things. Um, and I carry that into like concerts, their country and stuff. That I'm oh, still I getting the too. same like, experience. One of the things that I noticed, is, I mean, I happen to know the guys in a, a relatively large band in what I don't know, like the Troubadours or something. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a much bigger thing than. I would have ever thought right. it's gonna get you know, <laughs> right. and then you can like kind of compare that to other things you're seeing, and it's like, well, yeah, those guys are doing great, but something else is going on here. So like, yeah. it's happening. It's just not happening in the places, and I mean, maybe it's happening in like hip hop or something. You know, I don't know that there are people out there yeah. running around like religiously following Post Malone. No. But I mean, they I might know. be. I don't. I, don't I feel know. like people think I'm crazy because I do that. I latch on to artists, and I will travel across the world for sure. To go oh, see yeah. him play, like John and, Kennedy. You and know, and it's specifically, an obsession. like what genre of music would that be like for you? Mostly Americana stuff. Uh, I don't know. I don't know much. I mean, Jonathan Davis, Dermot Kennedy, completely different oh, sure. worlds. You know. Um, but right now, it's probably more. Uh, all all kinds of music grabs me like that. I'll mm -hmm. I'll fly anywhere to see someone that I like really really dig. Yeah, that that was kind of what I was. People went out to shows, mm -hmm. and now I just don't think they do. Like, I don't think it's like a thing. I mean, you know, Red Rocks or something, you know, or bigger shows. Right. You're seeing yeah. that stuff, but I don't. I don't know. Even like little bands would. You get a thousand people. Mm -hmm. You know, coming to see some band no one had ever heard of other than those thousand people. Right. right. I mean, you're basically <sighs> anonymous, but you do have a following. It's just kind of like isolated. Yeah. Really intense, you know. I, remember, I feel like Tavern's doing a really good job of that. They are. Because right. every show that I've went to there, I mean, there's been a couple. I think I took my daughter to one that there wasn't a lot of people at, but it was... Anyways. <laughs> well, but there's a, a lot of really good bands yeah. that people are showing up for it and I love it and everybody's dancing I'm like this is what it's supposed to be because Towers about. I think a lot of it's the venue I mean Texas is that there's a lot of venues in Texas where people will come out just because it's that venue oh it's like, been a year and a half or something but uh, uh, I did uh, the last American Aquarium record and when they came through town I went to the tower mm -hmm. and it was great they played really well it sounded pretty good you know right um, uh, and it seemed like a legitimate venue. It seemed like a, it reminded me of a smaller version of like the Granada in Dallas yep. or something. And I've been there a couple of times in the last few years. We I went with uh, Ryan Engelman and I went and saw Sleep there. Mm -hmm. We also went and saw McCain's, and I think I preferred it at the Granada. McCain's was just too damn loud, like yeah. painfully loud. And then we um, I went and saw Failure with Gabe, uh, the drummer for the Troopers, and. Uh, and that was a crowd that reminded me most of their fans were from the 90s. Yeah. yeah. They had gotten back together to do this failure tour. Right. And uh, that was a really good show. That was as close as I've seen lately. I'm more of like a what I was theater type venue person. I don't, I will not go to arenas to see people. I know that sounds yeah. terrible. My, I, it could be like, like I love Ed Sheeran, but I'll probably never go to one of his concerts because it's always a... I've missed out on a bunch of shows that were at bigger places. I didn't go see Iron Maiden. I didn't go see Tom Petty. Like all these bands that I kind of held near and dear to me over time. The last big show, I saw The Stones. But that was a long time ago. It's just different. Like, I don't know. I think it's different, band. but I went and saw Tom. And I was just like, oh, Well, now I wished I had. I didn't realize that was going to be like. <laughs> he was going to die. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you know, he had a cell phone. And day. Paul McCartney, like, I was like right in front of his guitar rack, and I was like, Yeah, See, if I, was I heard down close, I could do that. that. Everybody loved that. Yeah, yeah. if I could afford, afford to pay for like front row seats, I probably would go to arena shows. I think the last band I saw in a big arena was Metallica, and that was. was I? <laughs> I'd go see, okay. I'd probably go see the Stones again if they came. Just because I, I know it's oh, kind of close enough. There's out, certain you know? people. I would go see Dermot Kennedy in the arena. For yeah. sure. <laughs> I would go see him anywhere. Now, that you're going to have to help me. Who is this? this is, um, uh, he's an Irish singer-songwriter. He's not anything like any of the people we've really been talking about. Um, how do I even classify him genre-wise? He's a singer-songwriter. It's not just him. His band's incredible. Um, 
he kind of does this mix with hip hop and acoustic and like folk and oh really it's just really yeah cool um there's not a song of his i don't like i probably yeah i could obsess over all of them um yeah. it's more of his know. writing it's very poetic and he just puts on a very intimate show so it's cool his whole band's incredible they're great yeah i will quit being girl like that let it go sister i know i gotta let it go jeez <sighs> man it's just so good i'm still on a high i feel like right. people i don't know if people touch on this part with you a lot but um we were kind of talking about things we wanted to talk with you about and something we felt that was really important was kind of touching on um how people may think that they're going to get a certain sound if they come and record with you but really you do a lot of diversity and kind of shock people and that you're not stuck right in an avenue specifically because um your work with john fulbright got so big and that probably wasn't expected and then we were talking about I wonder if people think they're going to come to 115 and get this sound or if it deters people because they think they're just going to get that sound and how you're kind of I, I wouldn't be able to comment on that I don't know that I don't think it. that's a thing but. but I do know and I mean with, let's just say 2013 became like the year of people coming here because of John's record mm -hmm. uh, I mean there was a moment it sticks in my brain because it, it really scared me and up, it, it upset me like mm -hmm. oh geez you know right um i was talking to the, these people about making a record part of that little conversation is always so like what do you guys want to do what are you trying to accomplish what you know what are we just fill me in you know? right and and uh i, I can still see it happening because it's just like a deer in the headlights and they got the reaction was kind of makes me nervous to say it out loud he goes I, so what do you want out of this? And he goes, well, we want a Grammy nomination. Yeah, and I was right. like, well, I'm the last guy that could answer that question for you. I don't know how any of right. that happened or why it happened or whatever. And, and that was like the beginning of it. So that was a busy year, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it got, there was a lot of attention given to those artists and a little bit to me. Well, you, you too. Know. I mean, you were nominated for a Grammy. Well. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. but I think everybody, I'm just not that guy. Like, I, I promise you this. You're not coming to the studio. Right Paul and I had like, no idea. Right. Like, that was the first. The yeah. idea that that was even a thing is, I still. I just think it's amazing. It's ridiculous. I think it's special. That's what's so great it's about ridiculous. it. It's like you weren't going in there like we're going to make it great. You like you just went in and did a natural raw thing, and that's what came out of it. This room is like 1,200 square feet. Like. Yeah. If, if this isn't exactly the kind of place you set out to make something that has such a broad right, appeal, right? But you know, I but think those are kind of bad ass. Yeah. Right. It wasn't intended. It, it didn't have anything to do with me. I mean, John writes great songs and he performs them well, and you know, I was really lucky to be able to be the guy he entrusted because he had already tried to make that record a couple times, you know, I think, and uh, um, well, down, something down south. That says a lot, right? There. But we got along real well. He's, I still consider him to be one of I wish I saw him more, but like, yeah, right. I mean, we get along famously, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, those are the people that make great records, not guys like me, you know, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I, my job no, is to be, we my, disagree. <laughs> my job is to be prepared to make right. sure those people can, I don't want to make records that sound like you sound like right now. Mm -hmm. I want to make records that sound like you're going to sound in two years. Like, right. I want you know you don't want to make a record that sounds this is the problem with a lot of music that's released it's designed to be heard right once. now yeah and uh, right. i don't want to i don't want to own records like that i want to I, I buy those occasionally mm -hmm. to be supportive or whatever but right. i want people to listen to it more than once right i want, I want like them to that. go to it yeah you know like yeah you know I, the coolest thing is really you know when you're just you know i played a small part in all this but like when somebody I was doing a record for this huge dude, I, Rich, if you're out there, I love you. <laughs> and he's the singer for this metal band, you know, and I was going to do, uh, he did a solo record, and uh, he's just an, he's Rich from, uh, Big Dad Rich from Texas Hippie Coalition. So we're doing his record, and he's talking about Fulbright, and he's he's like, yeah, man, that, that song's my cry song. Uh, like like when he wants to like evoke an emotion, mm -hmm, right? Know, like this, he'll play high road, which is fascinating to me. Like, 
Yeah. I just figured that guy was like waking up with Judas Priest and going to bed with Slayer or something, mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Good songs are good songs are different. That they'll transcend genres and people will fall in love with them. I agree. They, can, they can find their own meaning in things, you right. know? Um, John's particularly good at that kind of thing anyway. But yeah. it's just interesting to see like how broad the appeal has been. And, you know, that was always the thing about that first record. It just went so far. Right. <laughs> yeah, no one, The idea that he's like that. in Norway or whatever. <laughs> right. right. Playing some festival <laughs> and everybody's singing all that's so weird. Isn't like that crazy. It's just not even that's I don't know. I don't know how I would deal with that. Like, holy crap, I was a part of that. Yeah, I don't know. I it's fun. You know? Over it. Yeah. You know, and, and getting to work with those people more than once is fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, like the troubadours, those guys are the barrel awesome. of monkeys. You know? Yeah. And uh, I'm on like, I've done like four records with them. In, in some capacity, I've worked on, right. I don't know mm-hmm. that anybody else can say that. You know? Right. But. Um, yeah. All their I think stuff it's because great. you, at, at least from the people that we've talked to, they're, um, awesome. they're great. People come in here, I, I think a lot of people go to other studios and they get directed. We, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, they kind of, they get... People have told you that? or Because uh, honestly, no, no, no. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't. They, yeah, they, something that's special about here, at least from the people that have had an experience here, is that they come in and they feel like they're making music with a friend, you know? And that you truly care about the sound that they're making and want it to sound like them, not like you. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's... I think that's something really cool that you're doing and why it was really special for us to get to come and talk to you about this because you have an impact on the artists you're working with that goes far beyond, oh, I made a record with Wes. They get to say, like, I made music with Wes and he helped me grow. Um, well, if I like something, if I like the way somebody does their thing, mm-hmm. I mean, why would you want to... I mean, I'll to, tell them, like, know? well, that's not as good as that, you know, or whatever. Right, but, like, right. I'm not going to... If you're gonna, if somebody's gonna ask me to hire a guitar player or something, I'll, I'm happy to do that. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to micromanage the guitar player. I want to hire the guy that plays well, and right. I like his playing, and then I want to hire him and say, "Hey, do that." Right. But, you know, that's way more fun. And then it's always like a surprise. And and I know that there are occasions where I work on records where like maybe the lyrics are in trouble, mm-hmm. you know, and so I'll. There have been occasions where I'm working on lyrics with somebody, you know. Yeah. But I always say the same thing. If I'm working on lyrics, you're in trouble. We should have already figured that out a long time right. ago, you know. Right, right, right. But, I mean, there are... Because I'm not a lyricist, what, you know. But but I am a sounding board, you know. Like, people can try out ideas on me. And I'm a pretty good listener. That's what like, everyone does. Everyone, that everyone has said that you're a great listener. I, I mean, Listen I just want to hear what I want to hear. I don't yeah. want to write songs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People that are way better at that than you know I will ever be, but I do want to tell them if I like it. Right. And uh, I listen. Music's been an extraordinary part of my life. I'm I'm really lucky. Like like I can't. I don't. I don't know people that find what they want out of life when they're four or five. Right. And and get to do it at even a mid you know like a mid level. Right. And have any kind of success with it, you know. Like, I can't even equate it to anything else. Like, what, what other job is there like that? Maybe, I don't know, acting or something. Because it was early know. for yeah. you when you started working on people's records, right? Like, the, yeah, in your you teens? Were. So, like, yeah. I mean, I started really playing bass. Um, I was probably 14. And then by the time I was 15, we the band I was in, we were recording already. So, right. And so, like, not too long after that, we were recording a full length and then after that I was starting bands and mm-hmm. you know it w- I was about 19 when another band said would you produce our record I had no idea what that meant I, I knew that there was a credit on the back of like records <laughs> that said produce, but, but I had I didn't know what that was I knew that I remember reading Van Halen records and seeing that there was like an engineer and a producer and not knowing what the difference was I had no idea they uh, that particular record I just became the guy that brought the beer like I brought a I always carried a cooler with me full of beer <laughs> so I just I, yeah, I like Western Oklahoma guys yeah man I, just, I had a strap <laughs> on Coco the cooler brought a cooler today. 
And so I, I, I brought beer, and then I would give them beer, and I think I was saying play it again. But like we had, rec my band had recorded there, and I got along with the engineer really well, and that guy was super patient with me, and he made it seem fun. Scott Miner, if you're out there, um, think about you all the time. And he just made it, he was also the first guy that told me we were doing something at some studio in Oklahoma City, and he was the engineer there too. And it wasn't going very well, and he just said, why don't we just say it didn't happen? Like, he was, I'd never heard that idea before, like, right. like we're just flogging a dead horse, you know, mm -hmm. why pursue this? And he was like, let's just call it and come back tomorrow or whatever, come back next week. And uh, I thought that was a really good piece of advice. Yeah. Because we were all yeah, nervous. Definitely. You know? but I don't remember what we did, though. I think we kept recording. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Just kept going. Yeah, I was probably 19. We did the Ruby Lane thing. And then there was somebody else that wanted me to do something. And then I got into like four tracking, and, you know. The next thing I knew, I was going to California. Well, I was going to the conservatory. Mm -hmm. You know, but that doesn't answer your question. It did. It did. I know we're both just like, oh, it's so I know, like, oh, about this yeah. story. <laughs> That's good. Keep going. We get in the zone when people are telling their stories. We're just like, yeah, they're so interesting. I love it. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, do you have a vision for what would you like to see the studio do in the next, you know, five, ten years, or like, have you thought about that it's kind of at all? Flow. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think the goal would be to get the hell out of Dodge, probably, you know. I don't mean literally leave the state, but just move the studio out on some land or something. Um, just someplace more private. Yeah. You know, Shoot, you can come out and... Put it right by boots. You know, we out in the country. <laughs> just like out in the country, like an outbuilding, you know, attached to the house, kind of. You know. um, well, like in Leapers Court, you know, in Tennessee, sure. that's where a lot of the oh yeah, of the recording studios are. It, and it it just kind of makes it a little more, I don't know, homey or mm -hmm. something. Yeah, but does. but that's one thing. And then, you know, my kid's thirteen now, and I've I, I mean, I, it's embarrassing to say it. I've missed it a huge part of his life because of this mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I kind of want to not miss as much you yeah know? I get but that I'm also at a point to where I'm super boring to him so I'm sure he doesn't care if I'm around <laughs> or not, you know he's but, reaching that weird age yeah you're like, oh god yeah, go away just yeah. <laughs> maybe not he's, yeah. he's I don't know I'm sure he thinks you're a badass every once in a while he'll bring up something you know mm -hmm. um well, at least he's, he'll tell somebody something about me or something, or he'll ask me some question and I know he's been thinking about it. Or, right. I don't know. Like, he'll ask about going to the Grammys or something. Because, you know, it'll just click in his mind, like, hey, were you there with so-and-so? And uh, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's footage of me playing online, like, you know. Um, <laughs> Did he hunt it down? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or my wife showed him or something. I know one of the more interesting things that popped up was it was the week Lemmy died and somebody posted a video of this band I was in playing in Tri-Cities, Washington and I'm wearing a Motorhead shirt. <laughs> I don't know if those were related but it seemed awfully convenient. Right. Those right. things came up and it's a loud rock show. It's, you know, it's like at an American Legion in the yeah. middle of nowhere and all these kids are just losing their goddamn minds, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of neat to watch. It's mm -hmm. just a sweaty punk rock club or whatever right. but he seemed interested in that um, and uh, that that band was Puller and we did a video you know that was on MTV and stuff and you can find it you know and he seems kind of interested in that mm -hmm. occasionally you know but he, he'll ask me questions about dreadlocks and stuff <laughs> like so tell me dad you know like he's <laughs> Or we'll see somebody with dreadlocks, some white guy with dreadlocks, and he's like, how come yours didn't look like that? <laughs> I don't know, man. Sorry, son. Uh, My dreads weren't as cool. That's going to be Callie's son, Cooper, when he's like getting a team. be like, Mom, son, can we talk about those moon boots? Yeah, yeah exactly. I want to know the story behind those. Or he'll want to borrow them. Oh, he does. Yes, yeah, he, he, he asked me if he could have a, a They're gold, silver, gold aren't they? Yeah. They are copper brown. Like gray and black. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. they're metallic though. Yeah. Okay. It's the brown metallic. Yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah. She's yeah. almost convinced me to get a pair. 
Well, wait, there's a part, the last part, the, the oh. good part. You already kind of touched on it, but we really like to kind of figure out or hear people's motivation behind continuing with their obsession with music. Like you said, you, I mean, you love it enough to miss a lot of stuff with your kid. So what's like, a, like some small things or little pieces of it that keep you going with it, that kind of, um, like restamp your love for it. I got a buddy, and he's been a friend for a long time. His name is Barry Strand, and uh, Barry's interesting because he invented a genre of music, and I find that fascinating. Oh, really? really? Sold a shitload of records, and uh, he's uh, one half of a band or whatever called Coyote Old Man, and it's it's basically like music you'd hear in a yoga studio or something. Okay, nice. But when he started it, it was. It, it was Native American flute music kind of put to like tangerine dream music, you know? Really? Like, nice. And it's really good. Like they do it at a very high level, you know? But Barry knows as much about music as anyone on the planet, you know? And, is, and he can qualify it and explain it and, you know, all this stuff. And he said this about me and he, uh, to me. And he's like, well, you have a compulsion to make records. I'd never, I'd never thought about that word or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, oh wow, it's a weird way to put it. He goes, yeah, you're compelled to make records. You don't really have a choice. Like, right. It's a, it's a compulsion. Now I don't know that that's a good thing <laughs> or a bad thing. No, I think that's a good but. thing because Josh Morningstar actually said that he was saying that he would lose his mind if he was not making music because that's what he was put on here to do. And if he did anything else, he would go nuts. And well, yeah, and I don't. It, it always fascinates me when people just totally check out, like when, they, especially if they've had some success, and mm -hmm. then they're, um, uh, recently we were talking about this one guy, he, he had a bunch of success and then he just disappeared, mm -hmm. and uh, I only found out he was still alive when he died, you know, oh, he, wow, like really? 20 years went by and it's like, oh, so-and-so died, it's like, oh man, how did, how did that happen, what, you know, where's the music that... You know, right. It's not, this guy wasn't like Prince, where it's like they're going to be releasing records for the next thousand years of shit that he didn't want out, you know? Right. Uh, this guy made a certain amount of records that were highly regarded, and then he just disappeared, you know? Um, I don't know how that works. I mean, I, I guess maybe you just get sick of everything, and you're like, I'm going to spend some time with my wife or my kid or whatever. Uh, in my case, um, I'm here enough to not want to be here all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I go and it goes in like cycles. Like, oh, I really need to take some time off. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like recharge. And in a day or two, I'm like, well, I got to go back. Cause mm -hmm. That's hard out there. You know, this is way easier. <laughs> um, right. And I, I still go through this thing. I, people make fun of this a lot. Um, it's very serious, but it's silly. When I finish a record, I feel like I will never work again like I, like when it all ends like okay it's off to press you know the press and everything you know. um it for, for 24 hours i'm just like i'm never gonna work again <laughs> it's the weirdest who would ever like, hire me you know, like oh in that way i was gonna say from the time like mental exhaustion from it or the fact that like the fear of not getting another job it, after it I don't even know how to like I've talked to people about it like you know and, and guys in my position or higher up they'll go oh yeah normal yeah oh yeah you totally invest normal. so much I mean I saw it with you working on Chris's record I mean you're like you're investing a little piece of your life and every it's hard to finish things when you're like all wrapped up in it you know? yeah it's like oh good compared like a really good book that draws you in and you can't put it down until it's done and then it's over and you're like that's it that, 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 that's oh, a lot I don't know like if I'm going to find another yeah. that feels this way. And I'm sure people that make movies feel that way. Um, Killian Murphy talked about, I don't know if, if you know him as an actor, but he talked about it in an interview where he kind of um, feels like he's unwillingly shedding a skin every right. time he finishes I like that movie. guy, by the way. Yeah, he's great. Um, I read, uh, when was it? A couple days ago we watched a movie that Jonah Hill made called Mid-90s. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. So, like, that's a movie about skateboarding you know, or skateboarding culture or whatever. And it would have been probably 10 to 20 years after my time as like a skateboarder. But uh, it really hit the mark, you know, like it, it's the best movie I've seen in a really long time. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, mid-90s, mid -90s? check okay. it out. 
and he I was interested enough to find some interviews with him about the movie like you know is he comparing it to this or this or what's he using as inspiration but he talked about how long it took to make that movie like write it I think he said like six years or oh something. wow and uh, you know from its inception creative uh, idea yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how I would deal with that I don't know what that would be like because you'd just be like oh come on I gotta yeah. do it again. Yeah, that's. I, I guess in his long. case, he's an actor, so he can stop making movies and go act for a while. And then, and then yeah, that is it. true. Yeah. Chris talks about that regularly. Um, now that the whole kind of like writing and recording process is somewhat done, he obviously has other songs on stage. He's like, shit, I don't know if I can like write and make another record. You know, like this is over, and now I kind of feel not worthless, but kind of like maybe the mission of what he was working on when he was doing it right. is kind of over the creation part of it. And it like always scares him that he's not gonna be able to do that again. Why well, I, I can say, I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. You know, there are a whole bunch of, if you're in his position, mm-hmm. there's a whole bunch of little pieces of the pie. You know, there's the writing part, there's the recording part, and then there's the playing part. And right. so like that record's gonna, you know, it'll be done and pressed, and then he's gotta go out and play it. Right. And he'll forget really quick about all of his insecurities about right. like being able to do it again because it's just another part of the puzzle. It's like, well, now we're on, you know, step three, and then it goes back to one. You know, like okay, yeah. now it's time to write again. Or like BJ from American Aquarium, he's he told me he only writes the songs that are going to be on the record. He's always been that way. He writes ten songs. That's the record. And he doesn't write another song until it's time to write ten more songs for the next record. Now, really? I don't know. That's interesting. I don't know if that's like truly accurate, but that was his description of it. And true to his word, I mean, huh. he's already taken the two weeks off to go write the songs for their next record. Wow. You know. So I and I just found that that out says online. a lot about his skill. Yeah. I'm like. And, and then there are guys like 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 Evan or Fulbright. Those guys are working on stuff for a really long period of time Mm -hmm. Uh, John especially like you know he he has I mean I don't think he'd mind saying this but he has you know like if you were to go to his old house with that piano he had two sets of like pieces of paper and one's on the left side and one's on the right side these are works in progress that he gets to a place where he's happy with them they go on the right side which was like the completed side and then he'll play those songs and it's like well fuck and then it goes back yeah, over the left side. So that. it's just like, you know, yeah. building it up. As in quite literally, like from the ground up, you know, every word needs to make mean something to him. And mm-hmm. It's super laborious and really artistic. And uh, it's not, and, and he, you know, in his case, he just makes it all seem like it, it's the easiest thing in the world, together. you know. Yeah. But he works really hard at it. You know? I think that shows in his songs, though, even if he's not directly saying it, you can definitely listen to his music and feel like, okay, a big creative process went into this. For sure. And he, you know, he's a student of songwriting and, Mm -hmm. you know, Evan's the same way. Both of those guys, I was real lucky to work with both of those guys. I think they're the best songwriters around, you know? Yeah, Um, I agree. They they make things look, they take very complex Mm -hmm. material and make it sound simple enough to digest Mm -hmm. and easy enough to assume that it just came out in one right. go and right. maybe some of it did but I mean what I've observed took some time yeah you know but there's I don't know um, what was the question you, you pretty I, I much answered lost. it um, you know what keeps you going with it what like moments oh I can tell you what keeps me going with it one is I don't know what else I would do <laughs> and the other thing is like Man, for a guy that's as cynical as I am, I am really optimistic. Mm-hmm. And uh, the next thing's always going to be better. I mean, it, I don't know why I think that. It's delusional, I'm sure, it's but it's think. like... No, I think I'm going to take that on. Well, and, and like, there's... I mean, it's kind of not the greatest philosophy, but, like, when I'm working with somebody, uh, I'm as big a fan of their work as anyone will ever be. Mm-hmm. You know? And sometimes I'll finish a record and I'll look back and I'll go... Yeah, I wish I'd have done this. But at least in the moment, well, however many months we're together, or right, weeks you're or whatever, in that. I just want to be their fan. You mm-hmm. know? And I want to make a record that sounds like the record I would buy. And I want to avoid 
making stuff that sounds like I don't want to hear it again. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I want it to be an experience for people. And that, and I, I want to make albums. Right. Like, I want Which it, is so different than what a lot of people are creating because a lot of people are very single. It's all singles. Um, and EP focused. And that's honestly a probably big deal of why there isn't like, that is a lot of the reason why there isn't the like religious cult following for Absolutely. bands and stuff anymore. Because I mean, I know I'm guilty of it. There's several artists that I have on Spotify playlists and things where I know one of their songs, and I go and listen to their stuff. I don't like anything else. It's just that one song mm, that I sure. like. And can I say I'm a fan of that artist? No, I can say I'm a fan of that single right. they put out. And um, that's a big deal. I know that's a lot of reason why people respect making music with you so much because you do want to make. My, albums. I mean, I can't say this, and I tell people this, so I guess it's true. My art, like if I have one at this point in my life, it's making 12, 10 to 12 songs carry a listener from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. I just enjoy that. I, I want to have an album, you know. And when people are just putting out a song or two at a time, like, I mean. I get why they do it for um, the, the way technology is and the way people listen now and what their habits are. But for sure. I don't, I don't know. It's not as of a thing to me well there's not as much to hold on to and mm -mm. just because you like don't fear the reaper that doesn't mean you're a blue oyster cult fan right you know what i mean right like yeah mm -hmm. i love hair of the dog but i don't know anything else nazareth did right. like i just don't <laughs> you know what i mean like you can yes i do you yeah. can go through a lot of you know there's yeah. very few artists that i love their whole albums right and then there are people you know like you become religiously fervent about your love and admiration for an act. Like, talk to a Slayer fan. They know every note on every record. You right. know, there aren't casual listeners. Right. Van Halen fans, like, not Van Hagar. You know, they're those people. They're like, you know, it's Diamond Dave or nothing, man. You know, <laughs> or vice versa. Um, I mean, you can name them. You oh know, my like, gosh. every big band, you know, has that kind of following. And I don't think that the industry's cultivating that in the same way that they used to. No, definitely not. There's certainly no infrastructure for it. And when you see people like like the Troubadours, for instance, or, or bands that are coming up behind them or whatever, the, they are... If you talk to people on the East Coast or the West Coast, I've had this experience, so I can comment on it. They don't know what's going on here. No. Mm -mm. No idea what's going on in Texas. You know, um, they might have a better idea now, but... There was a time, like I call it, a sweet spot, you know, in and around 2012 and 13, to where like Nashville didn't give a f up, LA didn't give a f up, um, you know. So people like John and the Troubadours and Parker, you know, all these people were bubbling up mm -hmm. and really experiencing a kind of success. I was pretty good friends with the guy in a huge band, and let's just say that like some of the bands we've just mentioned that are like regionally successful mm -hmm. they're doing way better than that guy was and i know how many millions of records that guy sold. right right and any you know we were friendly and i would stay with him um and he would at night he would bitch about like how much money he wasn't making you know when he died recently uh I, you know you find out all this shit later like oh he was broke and mm -hmm. that's why he was on tour and all this stuff and I don't, you know, that's a part of the old model that wasn't good for artists, you know. You could sell six million records or something and, not, and really not get any money out of it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now, these guys, like the Troubadours or something, you sell, I don't know, put a number on it, 50 to 100,000 copies of something, and you're we're rock stars. Yeah. So, you know, so there's a thing, this regional success is a, a thing that's kind of hard to, explain to people that aren't around to see it mm -hmm. but all you got to do is go to the shows yeah yeah absolutely you know absolutely go to go to red rocks or go to canes oh or go to and yes. you're gonna you're gonna see it you know and they're they've they've kind of leveled the playing field you know i mean houston rodeo yeah like what the <laughs> didn't cardi b play the day before or something Casey Musgraves, i think the day after or that's a weird level to be on how do you explain yeah. that to people you know um, tell stories it's one thing to like go to the oakland coliseum and see a band that 
your buddies, you know, on MTV right. and everything. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you deserve to be in this 12,000 seat, whatever the hell. Right. It's a whole other thing. How many? It was like 40,000. I don't know. I don't know. It was it, a lot of people. Way bigger than I thought. Yeah. Isn't it like 80 or something? I know Casey Musgraves had like 76,000. Yeah. Something like that for 74,000. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It, you know, but I mean, that's They great. deserve it, though. Oh, my gosh. Anybody that can do that, like the Cardi B thing, say what you want about her, but she's communicating whatever it is she does very well very with well. certain, yep. you know, my yeah. mother-in-law knows who she is, my wife knows who she is, my son knows who she is, and apparently I do too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I can't say that about a lot of people. Right. You know, my record collection is full of people that no one cares about but me. Right. You know, <laughs> like, no one. <laughs> like, my friend Rob Smith, uh, from Train Dodge has this really, he said this really funny thing to me. He was like, yeah, I have horrible taste in music. And uh, I was like, hey, you know, we like the same stuff. And he goes, exactly. <laughs> no one listens to what we listen to. And he was absolutely right. So. Man. This is, not to <laughs> be Namaste, like. mother. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love you. Yes. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> what, what? Coco and Narla, out. I'm gonna be out there smoking until you're done. <laughs> Come get me when, <laughs> when you've powered down.